Khan. So I'll just start by introducing uh, Ruani Kumar Singha. Uh, Ru and I have been working together for a few months now. Uh, but Ruani started off or was a product manager in Melbourne. She's got 15 years of experience in the IT industry, in corporate and startup environments. She's worked in product and account services, release management, business analysis, and quality assurance. Uh, Ruani is very passionate about um, us having informed or us making data-driven decisions, uh, and as well as creating an inclusive and diverse team. Okay, Ru, over to you. All right, thanks, Natali, for that introduction. I know no, Bani isn't no. here yet, but she's also been instrumental uh, getting this off the ground behind the scenes. And thanks, DCLK, for hosting these webinars. And obviously, you, who's joined as well. So thanks for making the time. Uh, so let's get right into it. So personal safety online. Let's first talk about, you know, how has being online affected us recently? So in the times of COVID, I think we've all been just so relieved to be able to be online, to do our work, to connect with people, to go to school and being online and having access to that has been a blessing for many of us. And so while technology has been great and it's been doing amazing things for us, there are also some hidden um, issues around it or threats that we might not always be aware of. Um, and often I think when we look at the traditional model, model, we find it hard to figure out, well, how do we protect ourselves and why should we, you know, isn't it taken care of by these companies and these products? Um, and people might just be a bit blase about it, but I might ask you, well, do you lock your doors when you go out? when you leave the house, when you go to sleep? Probably yes. And that's because, you know, in the traditional world, in the offline world, you don't want people to come into your house, to steal your money, to take your credit cards, to run off with your TV. But most of these things now happen online. We do our banking online. You know, our, our, we submit our credit cards on websites. And even if you don't do that, your banking systems are online. So your credit card, information is actually online, even if you don't use it online. And we've got smart devices. So TVs are smart, your phones are smart. And if you don't pr properly secure them, hackers could get into it and render them pretty much useless. So it's as good as a uh, robber coming into your house and running off with those devices. So it's really important that we do protect those devices. So. This webinar is really for anybody who locks their doors. If you think physical security matters, your online security matters just as much today. So you might ask, well, what is it? You know, what is it to be safe online? What does it mean? And there are lots of descriptions out there, but in a nutshell, it's protecting your identity, your data, and your devices while you're in line. You're online. We'll expand on this definition as we go, but let's start here. So what does your identity mean online? So it's any pieces of information that identify you uniquely. So it might be some kind of national ID card, a driver's license number, uh, your uh, passport, any details in there that identify you uniquely, like your date of birth, your name, so on. Um, and what are your devices? So devices are anything that's connected to the internet really. So it's your laptop, any device you're using now to connect to this webinar, your mobile phones, your smart watches, your smart TVs, any of that, right? And your data. So your data, it might be pieces of your identity data, or it might be anything else, the things you click on, the things you look at online for how long, the data you decide to share, like maybe your address as you're um, getting something shipped to you, or your location information. So if you're using uh, Google um, Maps, they know where you're going, what you, you know, uh, and from where to where, when, so on. That is your data. And I think many of us know that, oh yes, you know, I'm giving away some of our data, my data online, but we might not know the extent to which that's happening. And how much of that data is out there, who has it, what pants it passes through, and does it have an expiration date? If I want it back, can I get it back? There are a lot of unanswered questions around data. 
So I want to start off by talking a little bit more about data. So let's go to social media. <laughs> and so the, the model that they work off of is they gather data from all their billions of users. And I'm sure you consume some of these services. And I'm using Facebook as an example, but it's really any social media platform. So that's your Google, YouTube, even LinkedIn, um, Snapchat, Twitter, TikTok, all of them. So when I say social media, think of all of them, even though I'm using Facebook here as an example through my presentation. Um, so these, these companies take your data, mostly data you are giving away, perhaps without realizing, um, and then advertisers contract with them, pay them money to advertise to you. And they influence what you do, and they might even use techniques like fake news um, to you know, outrage you and get you to do particular things. So, uh, the, so make no mistake, they're out there collecting your data and then using it to influence your decisions and manipulate you. <laughs> so here's a really sneaky thing that they do on Facebook. So there's off Facebook activity. Now, you know, most people know, okay, if I sh on Facebook, it's out there, okay, I don't mind them having that. But what about the data that you give when you're not even logged on to these platforms? So you might not be logged on to Facebook, but you might be giving your data away. So let's take the example of uh, a Jane here. Jane goes to shoes.com and buys a pair of shoes and, and then she logs into Facebook later, right? So she wasn't logged into Facebook when she made the purchase. But she logs into Facebook later and then says, oh, shoes.com just sent me, you know, a 10% off coupon for uh, shoes.com or the type of shoes that I was looking at just a few minutes ago. How did they know? And, and that's crazy, right? And so there is data being shared even while you're offline. So even while you're not on these applications and it's used when you, when you re-log into these applications um, through advertising. So just remember that. And it's not just you, it's something to the magnitude of 2 billion people, upwards of 2 billion people who are sharing their data. Imagine what they could do with, it with that, the things they could predict. Um, so one thing I really advise straight off the bat is check your security and ad settings. Each one of these applications will have it hidden away somewhere. And it's important you take ownership of that and go check it out and change it to what you're comfortable with. Um, so I might just take a quick poll here um, and see what you feel about this question. So, so just expect something to pop up on your screen and please just select your answer. So I'm asking you, have you seen an advertisement that makes you think your microphone is listening to you? So it's yes or no. So let me know what you think. All right, we've got answers coming in. All right, anybody else want to make a selection? Okay, so let me just end the poll there. And let me share the results so that everyone can see it. So this was anonymous, by the way. Uh, so we had nine people say yes they thought their microphone was listening in on them and four people who thought no. Um, so a majority of you do think, oh, well, we're probably being listened to. And you, it might not be that, but it's that so much data is gathered. So much data is gathered off of us that these algorithms that work behind the scenes, that's basically code that predicts what you will do, predicted so accurately that they can advertise to you before you really made it made it public. So isn't that crazy? They can use our data and the data of billions of people to predict what we might want next, to, to the extent we might think, hey, are they listening to us? All right, and to drive in other threats out there, we'll watch a quick video. So I might suggest that everyone put their volume up on their devices right now. So you can hear 
well. Here we go. Hi, my name is Jenny Martin, and I'm the Director of Cybersecurity Investigations at Symantec. Today, cybercrime causes huge problems for society, personally, financially, and even in matters of national security. Just in the last few years, hundreds of millions of credit card numbers have been stolen. Tens of millions of social security numbers and healthcare records were compromised. Even nuclear centrifuges have been hacked, and unmanned aerial drones have been hijacked. This is all done by exploiting vulnerabilities in hardware and software, or more often by taking advantage of unintentional decisions made by the people using the software. So you got a little bit of an idea there about other areas where there are threats as well. And what I want to highlight here is that it's mostly because of unintentional decisions by the people using the software. And that is you. <laughs> and which is why what we do online matters so much. So who should care? You should care. And think about all the other people in your household as well. So you might be aware of it, but you might have children or young people in your house um, who might be on social media or clicking, downloading things without knowing the risk. And particularly with social media, they might be engaging with it before they're psychologically ready their growing brains might not be able to defend themselves against uh, addictive behavior, suicidal thoughts, um, cyberbullying. So it's really important you think about that and look at parental controls and things like that to limit their exposure. And you might live with older parents or grandparents who are new to technology, who might not really understand the risks and, and to give you a bit of a scenario of what happened, something that happened quite recently, one of my friend's fathers was on his email and downloaded a link and uh, a hacker took control of his email, locked him out and sent an email out to all of his contacts saying he's really ill, he needs a thousand dollars to be transferred, transferred immediately. And one of his friends believed it and sent over a thousand dollars uh, to help its friend. And so these are the kind of threats that are out there. And without awareness, without talking about it with the people around you, some people may be unaware. So it's really important to have these conversations with each other. So I'll, next, I'll go into some tips um, on what you can do to protect yourself. So clicking smart. So uh, traditional, uh, a really traditional threat is to send you emails, you know, quizzes, clickbait type things so that you are influenced and in, in your uh, pressure to kind of click something, to win something, and then that will behind the scenes download some malicious software which will take over your device or even slow it down to the point that it's really hard to use. So these sort of social engineering uh, and phishing attacks uh, can be very, um, uh, very persuasive and good. And I'll show you an example of where it can be so convincing. So here's an email from PayPal. So if any of you use PayPal, at first glance, you think that looks exactly like PayPal. They've got the right fonts, they're using the right colors. Um, and you know, it looks like I need to update my account. But here are a few things you can do before you do that. So look at who the email came through from. So you can see that's not an at PayPal account. So immediately you think, well, they wouldn't be sending it from some um, unknown email. It would come from the PayPal domain. And there might also be uh, inconsistencies with um, you know, the, uh, the coloring, the letters, misspellings. So watch out for things like that. That's really important because that might save you. And particularly with deals of, oh, you've won an iPhone, if the offer is, you know, if it sounds too good to be true, it is. Don't click on it, don't download it. And if you're really unsure, go to that website yourself. Don't click on these links. Open up a web browser, go to paypal.com, log in and check it out for yourself. That way, you know you're in control and you know where you are when you're online. Ooh. Um, let me see if I can undo that. Oh, 
give me just a quick minute to fix that up. Ah, there we go. All right, we're back. So the next one is creating complex passwords. Um, so many of us reuse passwords, and I am as guilty as anybody else with doing this. And you think, oh, well, you know, I can't remember 10 different passwords across my different logins. I'm going to use the same password. I'm going to use it with, you know, adding one or a, a, an apostrophe at the end or something like that. But this is really, really bad practice because hackers know we do this. So imagine the scenario where your email account was hacked into. So hackers got your email and your password and they're able to log in here. What they do is they'll try other websites as well. They know that most people also use PayPal and you know, shoes.com or Facebook. And now with one hack, they're able to get into so many of your accounts. So don't reuse passwords. And, a, and an easy way to do this is to use a password manager software. So this software, what, is, what it does is it helps you not only um, create strong passwords by default, it also helps you save it. So it's an organized structure. It's like, a, you know, think of a folder structure. It's a structure where you can save all your passwords and your login details, so you never have to remember it. So you only have to remember one password ever again, but that password you must remember. And it also lets you track these things or um, coordinate across devices. So if you're logging into your email on your tablet um, and on your laptop and on your smartphone, you can, you can use this password manager across your devices as well. Um, and some, uh, some software, some applications, like say your email, will also give you some recovery security questions and use those and save that in your password manager as well. Another thing you can do is to use multi-factor authentication. This is, this, this is actually just a, another level of security over and beyond your password. They, this application will give you a one-time password um, and this one-time password has an expiration on it. So to give you an example to make that clear, if you go back to um, that scenario where you're reusing password, sorry, where your email was hacked. So your email is hacked, they've got your uh, login and uh, your password. Now, when they're trying to get in, if you also have multi-factor authentication, they wouldn't have access to that token that's generated on the fly and it's time-based. So they actually wouldn't be able to log in. So that eliminates a lot of risk. And even if hackers get your uh, password, they're not able to get into your system. Um, web browsers and search engines. So web browsers are what you use to access the internet. So things like, so if you're on a Windows platform, generally it's Microsoft Edge. If you're on a, if you're on a Mac, that's Safari. But there are lots of others as well. So there's Google Chrome, that's really popular. But remember, anything that has to do with Google is mining a lot of data off of you. They know your search history, they use it to advertise things to you. If you've got your location on, on your phone or wherever, they know what locations you visit and they use that to advertise to you. So you've got to find a browser where security and safety is built in. So what I'd suggest is Mozilla Firefox. It's one of the safer browsers, but even then check your settings, update them, make sure you are comfortable with it and you have control over it. Now, if you are using other browsers, you can also browse in private particularly if you're using somebody else's laptop. Um, this gives you some level of security, but remember, it's not perfect security. Search engines. The search engines, that's whatever you use to search the internet. So Google is a really popular search engine, but again, really bad for taking your data. So if you care about not giving away your data, you might want to use something like DuckDuckGo. It gives you a lot more privacy and protections. It blocks trackers. It helps you search privately. It creates a secure connection. Uh, now, if you care about the environment and you'd like to also plant trees while you securely browse the net, 
you can try Ecosia. So Ecosia lets you search and it's much more secure than, you know, the likes of Google. Um, and they also plant trees behind the scenes for you. Oh, and just a quick note, remember we spoke about offline data um, shared to Facebook. Um, so even when you're not logged into Facebook, how other applications send their data. So something like DuckDuckGo blocks trackers. So trackers from Facebook from these applications can't get your data while you're browsing and share it, share it with your social media accounts. So just a quick tip there. Network security. So use a password protected router. Generally at home we do this, but now when we're out and about, we want to be connected. So we tend to just join unsecured networks, share data. I'd suggest you don't do that. Now, even if you do, try not to give away sensitive information. Don't send your bank details or your credit cards around while you're on unprotected networks. Um, you could use a VPN. So that's a great way to create a secure channel between the device you're using and where you're sending that data. It's virtually untraceable, it's secure and encrypted, so that's a way around it. A firewall. So a firewall creates an electronic barrier around your whole network that protects all your devices. Uh, and generally it comes, uh, it comes default with comprehensive security software. So if you're getting any security software, you might, you might wanna check, does it include a firewall, which, which would be great. Um, and it, it protects you from vulnerabilities around smart devices. So many of us have, you know, smart watches, smart thermostats, webcams, so on. And they're connected to our network, but they're not necessarily secure. They might not be built with security, you know, topmost in most organizations' minds. So they might be the vulnerable weak point where a hacker gets into your system. So that's so using a firewall eliminates those risks. And sharing isn't always a good habit. We're gonna watch another video. Um, so put your sound up, but more than that, you'll be reading some subtitles. So you'll have to watch the screen. So let me get that going. Ik zie een school tegen ons Ja. Insecten. Alsjeblieft. Ik voel twee insecten op je rug. Kan dat? Ja. Klinders. Slovenië, Slovenië, zo hè? De ene moto, oranje. Pas erop. Zie niet? Oui, oui, bien. Je hebt een vriendin, uh, Julie de. Ja. Een boeien klinders te sleven. Drie, vier. De vierde, daar zwijg ik meestal over, dus dat weten niet veel mensen. Er is nog een spiersje. <laughs> Maison rouge, balcon, plan. Ja. We can't actually see the video. Ik zie transacties, maar ik kent je rekening er van buiten. Ik denk dat ik het wel weet. Het staat wel negatief op je bankrekening. Ja? 9, 7. Last month, mm -hmm. we spent 200 euros on alcohol. Rooney, is there a video? Because we can't see the video. We can hear the, we can hear the, the, the sound, but not see the video. So maybe we can... Oh, sorry. Let me just... Okay, perhaps I wasn't sharing my screen. All right, can you see the video now? Yes. So maybe start at the beginning. Sorry about that. Hopefully I will restart. Ik zie een school tegen ons Ja. Insecten. 
Tabli? Voor twee insecten. Oké, okay, oké. Okay. Kan dat? Ja, klinders. Slovenië, Slovenië zo hè? De ene moto. Oranje. Patsero. Zie niet? Oui, oui. Bien. Je hebt een vriendin. Uh, Julie de. Okay. <laughs> ja. Een goede liefdesleven. <laughs> Drie, vier. Zo, de vierde, daar zwaai ik meestal over, dus daar weten niet veel mensen. Kun je eens met je <laughs> Met zo'n rouge balkon. Plan. Ja. Ik zie geld, ik zie uh, transacties. Maar kent je rekening niet meer van buiten? Ik denk dat ik het wel weet. Het staat wel negatief op je bankrekening. Ja? 9, 7. Last month, you spent 200 euros on alcohol. Vorige maand, 300 euro aan kleding gespendeerd. 8, 5, voor een huis dat van eigenaar gaat veranderen. 275.000 euro. Dat is eigenlijk. 41. Ja. Is dat juist? Ja, dat is juist. Oh my god. Oh man. Ah, dat vind je eng. So that would have given you an idea of the type of data that we share and what people can, can get out of it. So across all of these places we share data, there's so much about us out there and a hacker can very easily get to those things. So be very cautious about what you share online because sharing is not always a good habit. Online, sharing is not a good habit. Don't share your data. Um, and often there'll be lots of products and services that claim to be free, but they are not. You're paying for it with your data. You are the product. Um, and I'd like to touch on also data security, data privacy and protection laws. We might think that these laws are already out there and they should be protecting us, so we shouldn't be worried. But they're woefully inadequate. Plus, um, all these companies that have your data are worldwide. So they might be based in San Francisco, but you know, they might be harvesting your data in Sri Lanka or Myanmar or, or Germany or somewhere else. So in terms of the law, there might not be all that much protection to save you somewhere else as well. So there needs to be better data privacy and protection laws, and we should definitely push for that. That is one of the solutions to this. Um, and GDPR is fantastic. And one change in some an area's law triggers changes around the world. Now, Sri Lanka is looking at changing some laws as well to be in line with GDPR. So push your countries to make changes around that. But for now, we'll have to take fair safety into our own hands. Um, and we need to be aware of the threats. So to talk a little bit more about this, I'd like to go into the Facebook Cambridge Analytica data breach. So you've probably seen this on the news, um, and you know a little bit about it. But what happened? So what did the users experience? So what happened was people played a game. So they played a quiz uh, where, where they answered some questions and Facebook analyzed their personality and told them, okay, you're this sort of person. But behind the scenes, um, uh, political campaigns paid Facebook money to use that data to influence people. So it influenced and manipulated voters by giving them a lot of ads, some of it fake news, uh, to create and en to enrage them and to vote a certain way. So they actually wound up influencing an election of one of the greatest democracies of the world. Imagine that. So that is the power of data and data at such a huge scale where it's millions and billions of people. Um, and this is one incident you probably read about in the news, but there are so many others that you haven't, um, or I assume you may not. So there's the Do So campaign in Trinidad that affected their presidential election. 
uh, there was Facebook meddling uh, with in Myanmar, which led to people dying. Facebook um, did did give out an apology, but in the end, people lost their lives. Is an apology enough? So this is just to highlight the magnitude of the issue and why we should care. Um, all right, let's go to safe surfing. Now, if you look at the top of your URL, you'll see HTTP or HTTPS. Now, if it has the S on there, it has a padlock icon. That just tells you that it's safe. It's using safe technology. Your data is encrypted and scrambled, so hackers can't get to it. Um, now, if it doesn't have an S, it's not safe. I would suggest don't use that website. Um, and there might also be copycat websites, just like the copycat email we looked at before. There might be websites that look like uh, the website that, uh, that you usually go to, but they may not be. So look out for grammar mistakes, look out for inconsistencies, um, or if you're really unsure, just type it out yourself, and then you know where you are. Staying up to date. So using security software is really great, but put it on autopilot so you don't have to think about it. Turn on regular updates so if there are patches, if there are fixes, uh, you get access to them as soon as they come out. And same with your operating system as well. Don't put it off. There might be really um, good security patches that you need right now. Looking out for the latest scams. So scams are always changing. So hackers want to be one step, well, probably 10, 20 steps ahead of us. So today, that's ransomware. So um, they'll get into your laptop, say, you know, lock all your files up and ask you to pay a ransom to release them. And generally, they'll ask for that ransom in cryptocurrency, something like Bitcoin, which is virtually untraceable. So you pay them and they may or may not return your data. And there's very little you can do about it. So back up your data. So often we can't tell when our data will be compromised or a hacker might target a, a company that we have a, a login with and compromise our data. So back up your data. And based on your needs, you know, how sensitive your data is, your storage capacity, the frequency of use, pick an option that works for you, whether it's a hard drive or cloud storage, uh, whatever makes sense to you based on your needs. Um, so while we went through this, you might have realized that my initial definition about being safe online was a bit in inadequate. There's lots of implications of, you know, physical and emotional harm when you're online. And so we really need to focus on our well-being too. Being online, particularly on social media, can affect our physical and emotional health. There is a direct correlation to the time you spend um, on social media and your emotional well-being. Uh, depression and suicide rates have been going up. So that's really something we need to watch for, particularly with young people who are getting onto social media and are very easily influenced by it and just don't have the toolkit to deal with the evils out there. And time. I'm sure many of you have logged on to, to your social media accounts or your email and, and you, you've lost three hours and you didn't intend to spend that time that way. We're losing our time on these applications as well. And what can we do about it, you know? Um, because it's addictive, we really have little control over it. So being safe online is also taking back ownership of that time and taking authority over your life, the decisions that you make, because you're heavily influenced and manipulated. Now, if, if elections can be influenced by data and advertising, you know, think about how we are being manipulated and influenced. So we need to take authority over our life, and that's part of being safe online. Now, I'd love to talk more about it, uh, but we're running out of time. So we, we, what we thought about was in future sessions, we'd like to address things like tech addiction, you know, how it happens, how they've worked with our psychology and psychology experts are helping design these applications. Fake news, fake news travels six times faster on Twitter than real news. So are we consuming the truth, you know? Cyberbullying and particularly around with young people and how it's affecting their mental health. Reporting incidents, what happens when these incidents happen? What do you do? 
digital hygiene. So in the time of Corona, you know, we're always talking about hygiene, wash your hands, wear a face mask, but do we talk enough about digital hygiene? We're using more and more time, we're spending more and more time on our devices, but we're not having the conversations about how to do it effectively, to use technology to your advantage and not let it use you or your time. By the way, how to break up with your phone is fantastic, easy to read book, and I highly recommend everyone um, read it. And better goals for technology. Now these technology platforms were created by people who may not have intended this to happen, but now they've created a monster. But perhaps if we had better design goals, better goals for technologists, things might be different. And this is really something technology companies should be looking at. And as users, what we can push for as well. And I'd also like to look at, you know, how we can push um, change around data privacy laws and things like that as well. So in future sessions, we will cover these. And I'd like to take a quick poll just to see which areas influence, uh, sorry, <laughs> which areas interest you um, so that we can decide which ones we do next. So just give me a second and I will launch a new poll. So you should see that come through. And if you could just respond, you can select multiple. Tell us which ones interest you. Do you see a small pop-up on your screen? So just tell us what you'd like to know more about. All right, great. I think we captured everybody. All right, thanks for that. Um, so I just want to go back to what you can do. So I'll leave this screen on here while we go into Q&A uh, because I think the most important thing out of these sessions is for each one of us to think, I'm going to do something to protect myself online. So pick one. Pick one that makes sense to you. Change your default browser change your default search engine, uh, use a password manager, or delete your social media accounts. Now I'm gonna delete my Facebook because I spend way too much time on it. So maybe enlist a friend, uh, which, which I've done, um, and encourage each, each other to make changes around your life so you're more safe online. So with that, we'll go into Q&A. So if we have any questions, uh, you can unmute and ask, or you can um, send it so, yes, Rooney, uh, Rooney, we have some questions already. I've sent them to you. So, we had a few pop up during the session. Uh, the first one is, uh, is there a simple way to use email without falling trap? Without falling. Oh, so you could use other software that limits your time. So, it says, okay, I'm only allowed to use this application for 20 minutes a day. And then it locks you out. So, you can use something like that. To, so that control is outside of your hand, hands and it's time-based. Great. Okay, that was from Barney. You can also, um, you can also make the interface really ugly. <laughs> you can change it so <laughs> it's colors you don't like and it's visually displeasing to you. Okay, good tip. Uh, the second one, Rooney, we have is, can a password manager software be hacked? Yes, very good question. Yes, it can. Um, and many of them have been. I'd be surprised if none of them haven't been. But what's important with that is look at how they deal with that, right? When they get hacked, do their safety mechanisms actually mean that your data is not compromised? So I think it was last past, maybe a few years ago, they had some breach. But because of their safety mechanisms, the data didn't actually get into the hands of the hacker because it was secure and encrypted in such a way that it didn't get out. So yes, they can be hacked, but my personal thinking is don't worry too much about that, but look at how it's handled. And also hacks mean that they get better at it. So they've, 
they've closed a loophole. And you can only try so hard as well, right? There's no, there's never a hundred percent because hackers, like I said, will be 20 steps ahead of us, but you can do your best to protect yourself. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, it's a perfect segue into the next one. Do you have any recommendations on password managers? Uh, I hesitate to give recommendations because like you said, it's preferences, right? But I use LastPass, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and after you told me, I use it too. Right. Um, so we have one more question. Uh, um, so I just asked, uh, can you share like some top tips for avoiding email scams or phishing emails, which I seem to get a lot of? Yeah, so it's hard to completely eliminate them, but you can just look at your spam settings so those emails go to your spam. Uh, another thing you do it could do is now I know I get a lot of um, PayPal scam emails. I don't even read them anymore. I just don't read them because I know they're scams. And I log into my um, um, I log into PayPal, you know, straight off from the browser, so I know where I'm going. Um, so I think, is there anything else? Um, uh, for, you know, for, for certain applications, you might find I actually don't need notifications. Just turn them off. So if you didn't know, need them and you turn them off and you know you're still getting emails from them, that's probably a scam email. So that immediately tells you, I don't need to look at these. It's, scam. it's a scam email. Um, but um, you could also, there are ways to, like if you hover over a link, it does show you like where it's going. And if it looks kind of scammy, that'll be a, a giveaway. Um, and they say, you know, don't click on tiny URLs. Uh, you can check on the email addresses. The, you know, you can, and if you think it's genuine, you can just ring that person up. Don't use that same email because it might be going back to the hacker. Use another form of, um, another avenue to get through to them. Call them or use another email you know is theirs um, and check with them. Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I have had a few and I've been caught um, out, almost caught out. Uh, but I think it's also just using that common sense, you know, where you, you ask questions. Like I had somebody email, uh, message me um, on WhatsApp about some furniture that I was selling. And then the conversation kind of evolved and it seemed a bit off after a while. So I think sometimes, you know, when a robot is speaking to you or a computer is speaking to you, um, it's sometimes a bit off with language as well. So that's just some experience I've had. Uh, yep. We have another question. So um, are companies collecting data via voice and camera when we, uh, when we aren't aware of data collection? Uh, so many of these applications, when you when you log in, it says, you know, we'll take access to your 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 camera, to um, you know your uh, your photos, things like that. So, in essence, you are giving them access to it, whether they do it or not. It's hard to say without looking at each uh, company, but you are saying okay to it. So, then they could. So assume that they have access to it, then it's hard to say with, you know, without knowing the exact company and looking at their practices, um, whether they do or don't. Okay. Um, I think Shirani has a question. Uh, Shirani, do you want to ask Rooney your question? Hi, Rooney. Hi. Thanks for the information. It was a great session. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I just want to ask, I've never used DuckDuckGo or Ecosia. Um, we, I use Kiddle for uh, when my daughter uh, goes, has to go on Google for her school projects and things like that. Uh, now Kiddle is restricted, so sometimes I have to go into Google. Um, I do find because of the country that I live in that Google has some good pre-existing uh, content filters. So searches are uh, much more cleaner, uh, better for um, a kid to use. I've noticed that if I'm out of the country, uh, it's a disaster. Um, do browsers have, like DuckDuckGo, have inbuilt um, content filters or 
is there a way that I can go in and set up content filters? Um, see, Google settings like Google and Chrome in particular are really easy to use. And Google search, like yes. I will admit, is amazing, <laughs> right? And that's yeah. why we use it. We spend a lot of money yeah. on creating a really good product. So there mm -hmm. is trade off. Like I will admit that there is trade off. And sometimes Google will filter the searches better than another uh, browser, uh, sorry, search engine might. Uh, but Right. What you can do is just make it a practice to search on something like DuckDuckGo. And then they've also got right. this feature where you can put, like use things called, I think it's called a bang, uh, like G and uh, an exclamation mark, which will deliver the Google search to you through DuckDuckGo. So you can use okay. mechanisms like right. that. It might not look mm -hmm. the same and the nicest, but you could do that. Yeah. I guess it doesn't, right? Okay. Thanks for the tip. You're welcome. Yep, that's all, that's all for me. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Shirai. You. Anyone else? Um, we have no more questions listed in the chat. So if anyone else. Uh, I, have, I have a question. Yeah, go for Hi, it. Hi, Ruth. This is Rash. Uh, just a quick question on VPNs and use of VPNs. Uh, you know, everyone has used them from time to time. What's the risk of using VPNs? Or are they in fact safer to use? Or does it have an impact on data sharing or your security? Mm, using a VPN is good. Uh, but I mean, if you've got other devices connected to your network, um, there might be some vulnerabilities, but if you're just using a VPN to connect yeah. from say, your laptop to where you're sending mm -hmm. the data, that is right. still good. That is that is good. Yeah, okay. I would suggest doing that. Uh, but if you had say a firewall around your network, that's even better. Okay, got it. Thank you. You're welcome. Right. Um, Anyone else? Uh, Chris here, I've got a, maybe a question, but more of a sort of discussion topic, I think. Go for it. Um, so I'm a bit of a I'm in Australia at the moment. Um, I work in uh, IT for healthcare. So I've got a, a sort of a viewpoint on this that I think definitely we need to be concerned with our data privacy for things like medical records and all that sort of stuff because it's incredibly uh, valuable on the black market. I think it's one of the most valuable commodities on the black market in terms of private data. But I also think there's a flip side to data privacy in that, uh, which is evident through COVID especially, in that we have probably the best tracking data for the pandemic existing already in places like Google and Apple, but unfortunately we're, we're unable to use it. And I think there's, it's really interesting to see that sort of dichotomy between privacy, but also how it could be used for good in the sense of, you know, people's location, it can track exactly where they've been, who they've been with, and you could actually track the spread of an outbreak so much quicker if we had access to that data than what we can currently, because we've got Australia's got, you know, the Australian government's got an app, New Zealand's got a different app, Singapore's got an app, you know, everywhere's trying to do it their own way and it just, it seems like a very inefficient uh, way to do it. So, so, yeah, I'd be interested to get your thoughts and what you think about that. Yeah, no, you bring up a really good point. And it's, and like you said, it's not that data is a bad thing and we can do a lot of good things with it. And, you know, you being in healthcare, you see the reach of data and how you can sort of predict things and you can suggest things to, to patients and the, I guess when you have billions of data points like that, you you can save people's lives as well. So I definitely agree. And it's just that I think um, legislation needs to capture, you know, when it can be good, when it can be bad. And I think, and I don't mean by any means through this presentation to say that data is bad, right? It can be used for good. So I, I completely agree with you, right? I agree with you. It's just figuring out when 
it'll, it's used for good, we help it and we encourage it. And when it's used for bad, you know, there's, there's laws that protect us against it. Yep, totally. Yeah, but thanks for bringing that up, Chris. And, and this, the whole idea of this presentation is to create conversation like that. You know, some of it, you know, we're going into territory of where we don't know what's right and wrong as well with this, right? And just talking about it, making yourself aware, I think is, is the way to go and then we'll figure it out. And also, Ru, um, in Sri Lanka, I find the, there's, there's lack of data. So there's a lot of government departments, we have the data, but you're not collecting it effectively. And I mean, that's a good thing and a bad thing because we certainly don't have the legislator or the bodies or the regulation around the data collection, storage and use. Um, so I think it's a, it, that's a really interesting point that Chris brought up. It's, I mean, we need to collect more data in Sri Lanka because we don't, um, but I have a feeling we do. We just don't know how to use it or we're not effectively collecting it. So that it's in a format. So um, It's sitting in a file somewhere. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, for everything. I mean, even an government offline file. Correct. Government departments, they're not even collecting the right amount of data to even make decisions. Um, they, they're not even collecting it. So it's in a usable format that we can interpret it. So it's a, data is a, is a big issue. And, it's, and this session is definitely not about the data is bad. It's just about the effective use of it and making sure you're yeah. with it as well. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess it comes down to the you know, we're happy for our data to be used in certain circumstances, but we want to be able to control it, which is more what this presentation is about. So right. it's, it's a really, Correct. really good thing. Yeah. And I'm really worried about sharing my data here, to be honest, because we don't have any regulation or any bodies uh, to look after us. In Sri Lanka. And, it, and it was a really good point that Rube brought up earlier too, the fact that, because we've been looking at that at work at the moment, that even though we're collecting data, it depends on where those data servers reside. So if they're residing overseas, then they're not covered by Australian legislation. No. Absolutely. And, like, and the thing is, sometimes when I think about, you know, I'm not an expert on the law and sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around. It's like, how does this work? You know, what are the protections and so on? because it covers so many different disciplines and you might have experience in one and not the other. So it, it can be difficult to get your head around. And, and it's the same for me too. And we learn as we go. I think it's yeah, creating the discussion. So I'm really glad you know, people have been bringing up questions and suggestions and talking points. And if you want to bring up anything more and if there's anything else you know, you'd like us to cover as well, um, use the DCLK uh, contact details and, and yes. let us know as well. If anyone wants to join, um, okay, we'll, we'll wait for any, uh, any more questions, everyone? That's my clock chiming. <laughs> yes, it's 11 o'clock. <laughs> so, uh, Johnny Silva, did you have something? You just popped up on the screen. Not we have any more questions, anyone, before we look to just give you some information about DCLK and then maybe close the session. Okay. So if anyone uh, wants to join DCLK, um, we've got um, a button which, and you can even go on Facebook, we've got a Facebook page. Uh, and any questions post this session or you have any questions for us, uh, want to connect with us, please use diversitycollectivelk uh, at gmail.com to do that. Um, the next uh, last slide before we close is just how you can probably get involved with DCLK. Um, we'll move on to the next slide. Um, so you can volunteer. Uh, I can't see the slide, but I'll continue. Yep. So you can subscribe, absolutely. So you can become a member um, and uh, and come to our events and work with us. Now Rooney's a member, so she you can run your be a part of the webinar series. We've also got a, a thousand voices video, which is uh, people sharing their stories about diversity. 
um, you can volunteer. I started off with DCLK by volunteering before I uh, became, um, got onto the board um, and sponsor. That's really where we would love your support uh, because we need to go into these, into our communities, into our workplaces, showcasing women, uh, being role models and with your support. So for a sponsorship of an event, uh, it's the way to do it. So just to give us a bit more visibility and build our presence as well. So thank you. I know most of you are uh, members, but if you find somebody uh, or you meet somebody who wants to join, who wants to be a part of a bigger network, please advise them to join, contact me, uh, or, or just sign up via the Facebook page. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Ru. Uh, that was a great session. And thank you for the discussion, uh, all the tips. Uh, and yeah, if you want to say a few words and then we can close. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining and especially DCLK, um, Natalie and Barney for coordinating things behind the scenes as well. So thank you. Yep. Just remember to, to do your action items. Remember, I'll go back to that. Yes. <laughs> Just do something today. Yeah. Great. Thanks everyone. Thank you everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah.